Chapter 1 As he sat outside the student advisor's offices, David Hunter's thoughts turned to his dreams. His obsession with the dream world was the very reason he sat in that hard, cold chair, trying to save his academic career. He had been practising lucid dreaming for years now, ever since his parents had abandoned him as a young child. Lucid dreaming had become his escape from a world he didn't particularly like or feel he belonged in. Unfortunately, he owed his aunt for taking him in, and studying law was his way of thanking Aunt Jen for not dumping him with social services and letting them foster him out. Since there was a whole line of hunters who had become successful lawyers in the past, his career path had seemed pretty obvious. He didn't like it. Bored him to tears, really. But there wasn't a career out there that utilised a skill like lucid dreaming, so law it had to be. David Hunter? said the stern-looking secretary. Yes, yes, that's me he said, standing and walking toward the woman with a clipboard nestled in her arm. She looked over her horn-rimmed glasses at him. This way, David. The female advisor behind the desk briefly glanced at David as he entered the room, motioning for him to sit in the chair in front of her. She continued to write as the phone rang. Pressing a button, she cut off the shrill tone and turned the full force of her attention on him. David flashed a smile, maintaining eye contact. Charm had gotten him this far in life, and he would use it to get him out of this mess. Fortunately, she was an attractive 30-something brunette, with dark olive skin, very little makeup, and dressed in nice business attire. The plaque on her desk read, Amisha Batia. Amisha rolled her eyes, which took David by surprise. You're in deep shit here, Mr Hunter, so drop the pretty boy flushing routine. Well, that's not very cordial now, is it? He looked at her name plate again. Amisha. He was a little taken aback, but liked her fire. Yeah, well, we've no time for pleasantries. That seems to have been your problem all along. And where is Danielle? David asked, referring to his previous advisor, one who had been much more appreciative of his pretty boy flirting routine. I've taken your case over from Danielle, as this has escalated to the Progress Committee, and you're in danger of being thrown out of the university. I'm sure we can work something out. David said as he picked up a paperweight from her desk. The look on her face told him she didn't like that move. Do you think your aunt's money and influence is going to carry you through the last two years of your degree? No, you actually have to put in the work and pass the exams. No passing of exams means no little piece of paper to say you graduated and no little job in a solicitor's office being the tea boy for a few years. She stood up and took a thick folder from the bookshelves behind her. She dropped it with a thump on the desk. This is a list of all the people who've been thrown out of university. Every single one of them were given multiple chances to buck up, but they were still thrown out. Their money, their family name and their status weren't enough to buy them their degree. And you sure as hell aren't going to buy your way through it either. Unless you're just sickeningly wealthy. David put his hand in his pocket and pulled out some loose change. Well, I do have exactly three pounds and twenty-eight pence, but... He held up his forefinger as if just remembering something. I get my student loan payment at the end of the week, so maybe we could. He held up two hands and seesawed them. You know, come to some sort of arrangement? She laughed derisively and shook her head. You don't have the money, but your auntie Genevieve Hunter does. If it wasn't for her, you would have been thrown out a long time ago. David sighed in mock defeat. 
what the hell is it with all the hostility? I'm here to get advice and representation from you. No, you're here to study. You're here to get a law degree with hard work and effort. What you are not here to do is go out in the piss and get stoned with your friends every night. I've got another meeting with the Progress Committee in a few weeks and if I don't get reports of improvement, I will have to recommend that their recommendation of dismissal be upheld. You've got exactly two weeks to resubmit two 1,500-word essays and resit the two exams you failed. Okay, dokey. I think I can manage that. The student advisor stared at him, appearing weary. What do you want to do with your life, David? What is your purpose? My purpose? I'm 22 years old. I don't have a purpose. David ran his hands through his unkempt hair. Amisha walked over to the window and looked out onto University Avenue. He did his best to avoid gazing at our rear. We all have a purpose, David. I suggest you go away and think about yours, as I don't see it being at Glasgow University. She turned and gave him one last reproachful stare before waving him out of her office. David rose from his seat and walked out of the room, smiling. He kept that smile firmly affixed until the advisor's offices were far behind him. Shit! David walked slowly down the steps of the student services building, trying to figure out what he would say to Aunt Jen. Shit, shit, shit! Making his way down University Avenue, David considered the consequences he faced if thrown out of university. Why the hell didn't I do something about this before? He knew the answer already. His Aunt Jen always bailed him out. Her loyalty to his parents was something he'd taken full advantage of over the years. She wasn't going to be happy about this at all, and she wouldn't be able to bail him out of this one. He thought about her disappointment in him. She might not say anything, but her silence was often worse than her censure. With his head down, he walked past the Bower building and onto the medical school. The light from the sun bounced off the car windows as he took off his jacket and slung it over his shoulder. The west end of Glasgow was always thriving, always so full of energy. It was a different atmosphere from anywhere else in the city. David could never figure out why it felt that way to him, but he supposed it was the mix of affluence and intelligence. After all, Glasgow University was at the heart of it all, and the property prices were exorbitant, meaning only the wealthy could afford to live here and rent out property to the students. He loved it, but knew it was his aunt who had made living here and attending university possible. Without her, he would never have been able to stay in this part of the city. As he walked, he thought back to the conversation with the student advisor. Then thoughts of his absent parents made an appearance. He got angry as that old familiar fuck you world attitude built within him. Trying to distract himself, he thought about his most recent adventures in the lucid dream world, a place where he did belong, a place of his own creation. An amazing world where he could meet different people, have sex with beautiful women, literally fly around the world, soar around the cosmos and speak to his dead grandparents. The lucid dream world was his escape, his passion, his solace, his place to hide from the realities of his existence. And yet he had no idea how he did it. The question still remained after years of lucid dreaming. How was it possible that he, of all people, could do it. Was it just an escape from the reality of life or was life an escape from the reality of his dreams? His fascination had deepened over the years and his studies had led him to some amazing people in the field, not to mention some weird and wonderful Reddit boards. Focus. What would he tell Aunt Jen and his friends? Christ, what will I do for a job? 
That thought scared him more than the thought of any arguments he might have with his aunt. He didn't have any skills or experience in anything other than studying or pretending to study. He felt a weight pressing on his chest and his breathing became laboured as he realised the gravity of his situation. Shit, what the hell am I going to do? Cars, vans, buses and motorcycles queued on Byers Road. The noise of the traffic, the low hum of people talking around him, and the general business amped up his anxiety concerning his pending confrontation with Aunt Jen. He slipped between the traffic and crossed to Downside Road, walking quickly with his shoulders hunched. He stared at his front door for a good ten minutes before mustering up the courage to enter. As he twisted the Yale lock and gently pushed the door open, he heard his Aunt Jen speaking on the phone and pulled back slightly. He's not exhibited any signs after all this time, so I think it's safe to say he's not going to. She stopped to listen. Oh yes, it's a blessing as he'll be out of any danger. I don't know if I'd want this world given the choice. She laughed and paused again to listen. David's toe caught on the rug, causing him to stumble. She turned around, startled. David! Putting her lips closer to the mouthpiece, she whispered. I'll call you back later. David closed the door and started to take off his jacket. I think it's time we had a talk, don't you? With his back turned to her, David grimaced and rolled his eyes. Here it comes. That didn't take long at all. He drew in a deep breath and turned to face his Aunt Jen. She might have been small, but her words always packed a punch, and from the look on her face, censure rather than silence was forthcoming. This was going to be a beating. How are you? David said, lifting his voice, trying to sound cheerful and nonchalant. Don't you give me that. I got a call from Danielle. What's going on at university? She placed her hands on her hips. Always frightening. Aunt Jen, it's not a good time for lectures. It never is, David, she said, looking at him with narrowed eyes. You're failing all your exams. You're out drinking with your friends most nights. And you bring home girls I don't even know. I give you as much leeway as possible, David, but you're throwing it all back in my face. Her voice became higher pitched the longer she spoke. She disliked giving lectures just as much as David disliked hearing them. If you get thrown out of university, you'll have to move out. As much as I hate doing it, you need a bit of tough love. Yeah, cos I've never really had any other kind of love, right? David said, referring to his parents. Oh, for goodness sake, we've been over this. I know this haunts you, child, but you have to believe me when I say your parents didn't abandon you. Aunt Jen, I'm not a child, but you keep treating me like one. You keep telling me they didn't abandon me, but you have no other explanation to offer. They dropped me off at your doorstep and disappeared. From where I'm standing, that's abandonment. I haven't seen them for 18 years. I don't know if they're dead or alive, so tell me something, anything, for Christ's sake. Be very careful of the way you speak to me, David. Not going to address it then? I'm 22 years old, nothing. And where am I going to go if you throw me out? David ran his hands through his hair and then rubbed his face. It had been a shit day, and this had made it worse. I warned you months ago that the deal was you could stay here rent-free as long as you did well at university. Aunt Jen turned away, pacing in front of the bay windows, as David sat on the brown Chesterfield sofa opposite. I mean, what is it that you want to do? What is your purpose in life, David? He looked at her, askance, brows furrowed. 
That was the second time he'd been asked that question today. He shook his head and raised his hands in defeat. I don't know. His throat was tight with emotion and he could feel the tears pressing the backs of his eyes. He swallowed hard and kept his mouth closed, blinking quickly to stop the tears from rolling. Well, you better decide quickly, or you'll be out on your ear, with no prospects, no job and no experience. No doubt you'll get some girl pregnant, then you'll be living on benefits in a council house somewhere, scraping by to make ends meet every week. Her voice became even more shrill. What would you know about benefits and living in council houses? He shouted, his anger exploding. His aunt's face darkened with colour. I fucking lived that life when I was younger. I stayed in a crappy council tenement, married to a loser with two kids to raise on my own. I took you in and loved you as my own. I fucking know that life all too well and I'm trying to keep you from going down that road, you selfish little shit. Tears sprang to Aunt Gent's eyes as she turned and looked out the window. And I can't, I can't tell you anything about your mother and father. It's for your own good. Don't you see that? David shot to his feet, anger and hurt burning within him. No, I don't see that. I don't see it at all. I was four years old when they left me here. And you haven't told me why. I don't know if they're dead or alive, but most of the time I wish they were dead. Better that than living in this world with no desire to see me. He quickly walked out of the drawing room and ran upstairs to his bedroom. He slammed the door and threw himself onto his bed, staring daggers at the ceiling. He'd really done it this time. Aunt Jen never swore. His angry thoughts thrashed about, fighting to make sense of things. All he got for those efforts was the beginning of a migraine. Exhaustion tugged at the corners of his mind and he gratefully allowed it to take him, knowing he'd find relief on the other side.